Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual planetarium from the Museum of Science in Boston, where we bring the universe right into your home with some planetarium educators as they teach us about some amazing topics with our universe. At this point, I'll ask my educators to introduce themselves. We'll be looking for questions in the Q&A chat on Zoom, and we will be happy to answer those questions as we go throughout the, the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will be uh, your main e educator as we talk about uh, the first spacecraft uh, from the United States, but I will not be doing it alone. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be handling the visuals today. Awesome. Um, and I think I realized that I said first spacecraft when I meant first space station. So last week, uh, if you tuned in, you heard Talia talking all about the very first space station ever in the world. Um, and that was Salyut pro the Salyut program, or specifically Salyut 1, um, which was a mission undertaken by the Soviet Union. And that was in the early 1970s. And just a few years later, the United States launched uh, its very own spacecraft, uh, space station, called Skylab. And Skylab was the first and only space station that was completely owned by the United States. So uh, a lot of folks are probably really familiar with the International Space Station, and that's a collaboration between many different space agencies around the world, um, comprised of many, many different countries. So it is not you know, primarily one or the other. Uh, so Skylab was completely run, owned, controlled by the United States. So it was launched back in 1973. The first launch was uncrewed. It was just to get it into orbit. It did launch off of a uh, Saturn V rocket. So the Apollo missions had just recently ended in 1972. And a lot of that technology was actually used in uh, the Skylab space station, as well as the Skylab crewed missions, um, Skylab 2, 3, and 4. So it used the Saturn V rocket and it went into a low Earth orbit. Um, it lasted for about six years in orbit. Um, the active missions didn't last that long um, for like the last, uh, I believe it was uh, for the last few years of its journey, it was just kind of orbiting in space, just waiting to come back down for its orbit to decay. Um, but there were three crewed missions that actually went um, to uh, operate this space station with astronauts living on them. So to give you a sense of what this spacecraft or the space station looked like, um, we can show you a diagram. So it was made up of uh, the main workstation, the main orbital workstation, so, or the workshop, I should say. So uh, the thing that's labeled Saturn workshop, that whole kind of interior was the main area where the astronauts uh, lived and did most of their work. Um, inside there, there was the ward room, which was where they ate a big table for you know, hanging out, not that they had much time to do that at all. Um, and they had, you know, all the other amenities that they need um, to live comfortably on Skylab. So if you, you could kind of think of the Apollo missions that were sending astronauts to the moon as kind of like a camping trip. And this is kind of more of a glamping trip <laughs> where they had a lot more um, amenities and it was definitely more comfortable um, than, going to the moon, because if you look on the bottom left side of this um, artist diagram, you can see the command and service module. And so this particular command and service module was the same model that was used throughout the Apollo missions. And so the Skylab astronauts had all of this space to kind of move throughout and perform experiments, but the Apollo astronauts just had uh, that little module on the bottom left there uh, where they spent their time. Now, the astronauts on board Skylab were there for a lot longer than the astronauts were on uh, the Apollo mission. So 
and they kept getting longer. Skylab 2, um, they were there for a few weeks. Um, Skylab 3 was two months. Uh, I think the first Skylab 2 was actually closer to a month. Uh, Skylab 3 was two months and then Skylab 4 uh, was a lot. It was like 84 days, I believe. Um, so they did stay for much longer periods of time. Uh, you can see that the the main source of power here are solar panels. There are a lot of solar panels, primary ones, as well as these kind of uh, solar um, like that cross formation that Talia is pointing out right there. Um, and that's how the station kept power. Um, now, as we go into each of the crewed missions, you will realize that this was uh, each one had something go really wrong. Um, and for the first, just the launch of Skylab itself, um, the solar panels ended up not faring very well. So with the launch of Skylab itself, as it was going through the atmosphere, the outer meteoroid shield tore off. So it's like this shield to protect Skylab from, you know, uh, any collisions in orbit around the Earth, even with little super teeny tiny pieces of rock or pebbles that could be in orbit around the Earth, um, they can poke holes, um, which does happen occasionally. So this shield was meant to protect the station from that type of debris, as well as heat from the sun. And so when this shield, uh, it was going through the atmosphere and then the whole shield just tore off and it damaged one of the solar panels. And also uh, it stopped one of the other solar arrays from being able to deploy at all. So like right off the bat, complete disaster already. The uh, space station didn't have power. Skylab itself was baking, um, which caused like these different chemicals inside the atmosphere of the space station to be released, which could damage um, the film that was used on different cameras and the observatories on Skylab, as well as their food supply. So the first crew was actually scheduled to launch the day after Skylab itself launched. Um, but when all of this, when all the solar panels had, had issues and the shield tore off and the atmosphere got all poisonous, essentially, um, they had to delay that, uh, that crew for about another like week and a half or so so that they could train on how to repair uh, the solar panels and so that they could also cycle the air from ground control um, to kind of get all of the gases that were in there and just purify it and renew all of the gases inside of there. So it was delayed, but they did make it up there 11 days later. Um, and once they got there, they pretty much just had to work on fixing it. Um, they couldn't even really dive right into their uh, science experiments whatsoever. So they they ended up deploying um, like a backup heat shade and they were able to free the solar panels that were unable to deploy. Um, so once those repairs were made, they were finally able to um, dive into their, their science experiments. Um, and this particular image that you're looking at here is an image of Skylab itself as Skylab 2 departed. Um, so that Apollo command and service module departed away from it upon its return. And you can actually see uh, that one of those primary solar arrays there is just kind of missing. So they did do quite a bit of repairs, definitely made it fully functional again, um, but subsequent crews would also have to continue repairing it. And this was the first time in history that a repair of this magnitude was ever performed in space. So it was a pretty impressive feat. Um, another repair that, I, that comes to mind is the Hubble, but that was 20 years after this, um, when the Hubble mirror turned out to be uh, defective, astronauts had to perform spacewalks to uh, fix the mirror and actually replace parts of it. Um, so that, that would be an example of another really major um, repair in space. But this one, was the first. So that is Skylab 2. And now we can move on to Skylab 3, which launched 
uh, a couple of months later. So that was the launch of Skylab and Skylab 2 were in May of 1973. Skylab 3 was in July of 1973. Now, this, uh, this particular mission didn't go smoothly either. Um, as the uh, as as Skylab three was being launched, um, the one of the thrusters in the Apollo Command and Service Module turned out to have a leak, a propellant leak in it, um, which actually made it a lot more difficult for the astronauts to actually dock the module with. Skylab itself. They were able to do it safely, thank goodness, um, but it was more difficult. And then once they got there, they just had to keep troubleshooting and try to fix the issue. Six days later, another leak happened uh, in, in one of the thruster quads in the module. So a rescue mission was actually rolled out from Kennedy Space Center. They had a backup Skylab ready to go and they put it on the launch pad and it turns out that the astronauts figured out that they were able to safely operate the command and service module with just the two remaining thrusters that it had. So they scrapped the rescue mission and decided that it was safe enough for the astronauts to um, continue doing their work. And I should mention that a lot of the science going on on these particular missions were about uh, the human body and how it adapts to the microgravity environment. So in Skylab 2, that's kind of the first time that they really uh, did some studies into what's called like puffy face syndrome because your face kind of swells up um, just from like fluids in your body not being super affected by gravity um, and just floating around, everything kind of just evens out. So um, they did more studies on that. They did um, studies on just like changes in the physical size of the body as well. Um, and a whole bunch of other physiological experiments. Um, there was also a lot of solar and space science going on. Um, there was a whole telescope dedicated specifically to studying the sun, a solar observatory, as well as an observatory to study the earth. Uh, so lots of, of really cool um, experiments going on during these times. And a lot of them were done on uh, Skylab 4 as well. And I think, oh, and I should mention in this particular picture that you're looking at, um, this astronaut was performing an EVA or a spacewalk to continue the repairs from Skylab 2. So he wasn't repairing anything about the, the thruster quads on the module. It was actually to install um, like another sunshade um, to help with temperature control on Skylab. All right, before we go to Skylab 4, have there been any questions that have come in? Well, we had a great little piece of um, just a personal memory here from Regina, Regina, who asks, just a not a question, just a comment or point of interest. They handed out those Skylab stickers in my elementary school. So just a little bit of a personal history connection there. And then there is another question here also from Regina. Did they ever take animals up in the Skylab space station? Um, Yes, oh, that's super cool, by the way. I love that. Uh, I would love to see one um, in person. And they did try to take animals up. Um, they took a bunch of mice and gnats, so like those little flies. And there could have been some other ones, but those are the only two that I am familiar with. Um, and they were going to do all of these studies on how microgravity affects like various biological processes within mice and gnats, um, but it turns out on the way up, they all ended up dying. I think there was some kind of issue with like their container or something wasn't pressurized right, or I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, I know that the animals did not make it uh, all the way to the point where they could start doing scientific experiments on it. As far as Skylab, four goes. Um, I'm not sure if they were able to successfully get them up there at that time. Um, I think they were, but I'd have to do some more research. But I know that I think they definitely tried to get mice and like fruit flies and things like that up there. 
All right. Uh, so this picture is Skylab 4. So they all launched from um, using Saturn rockets. The original was the Saturn V, and then the rest of the crewed missions were launched by the Saturn 1B rockets that were a little bit modified from uh, how they have been used previously. So Skylab 4 was an all rookie crew. So all of these astronauts had never been to space before, um, but they were obviously trained very well. Um, and this was the longest mission. So the, the entire mission, I believe, lasted um, 84 days. And once again, uh, it was not exactly the smoothest of missions, but it was one of the most productive missions um, from this time period. So on the way up, one of the astronauts on board was suffering from space sickness, which is basically like motion sickness, but your body is just doesn't know what to do because it's in microgravity. So, you know, you, you get a whole slew of symptoms that can come along with that. And I believe the statistic is like up to half of all astronauts experience space sickness to some extent. Um, and it's not a weird thing. It's not something to be like incredibly concerned about. But on the way up, one of the astronauts had it and uh, tried to like hide it from ground control. And subsequent listening to the recordings um, showed that they, they were basically hiding that one of the astronauts was was really sick. And Alan Shepard was the chief officer of astronauts at NASA at the time. Alan Shepard was the first American to ever go into space. Um, he was not happy about that. Um, he said it was a really poor judgment on their part. So not a strong start. But they get up into space. Uh, it turns out that there are some more technical problems with the gyroscopes that are on board. Um, so the gyroscopes are how the uh, Skylab station itself is able to maneuver. So if it needs to like alter its direction or course at all, it is all done by these gyroscopes. They started failing, but the astronauts did, they were able to repair them. It turns out like that they weren't temperature, temperature controlled enough and they didn't have enough lubrication. So they were able to um, fix all of that and then get to work. They studied uh, the sun quite a bit. Lots of really awesome pictures coming from uh, Skylab 4. They also studied um, this comet, they saw it, uh, I forget what the name of it. I wrote it down. It's called Comet uh, Kahootek. Talia, do you know that one? Am I saying Kahootek, it correct? correct. Kahootek. Okay, awesome. Uh, they were able to see that from space, which was really cool. But soon they realized that they were incredibly uh, overworked. It became like pretty overwhelming with how much um, how much they had to accomplish, even just getting to the space station and unloading like thousands of pieces of equipment. That's kind of when it all started. So it just kind of the produ productivity went downhill from there. Um, and there was one point where uh, in order to to increase if work productivity, um, they had daily press briefings. And so they decided that only one astronaut needed to attend those while the other two could continue working. And when this happened, they all forgot to turn on their radios. And so there was like this brief period of time where there were no communications between the astronauts and ground control. And it was really concerning. Um, and it was like at this kind of breaking point where NASA was like, okay, they, we need to pull back a little bit. We're putting too much pressure on them. Their workload is too high uh, and it's, it's, it's dangerous. Like it could, it's just simply not safe. Um, so once NASA kind of pulled back on all of their duties up there, the astronauts exceeded, they actually accomplished more than the other two Skylab crews did. Uh, and it ended up being like one of the most productive um, missions like in NASA history. So don't overwork yourself. <laughs> So here is uh, another picture of Skylab 
from Skylab 4 as it was departing. And I just want to mention some of the cool pictures and experiments that they did on board. So as well as a lot of like human physiology, life sciences, um, things like that, they did a lot of, of course, astronomy as one would expect. And so this picture, uh, it's so cool. This was the first picture or first recording ever of a solar flare happening on the sun. And this one is particularly huge. Uh, a solar flare basically happens when the magnetic field of the sun gets all tangled and snaps and releases all of this material out into space. So like charged particles um, just and radiation just hurtling out into space. And it can affect the Earth if it's headed toward the Earth, all those charged particles, it can get trapped in the magnetic field, travel down the field lines and enter Earth's atmosphere near the poles, which is how you get aurora. Um, the interaction between those charged particles and molecules in our atmosphere kind of excite, uh, and they release energy in the form of light. So that's how we get the aurora. So lots of, I think they took, ended up taking like 75,000 images of the sun um, just on this particular mission alone. They also did a lot of studying um, the earth and meteorology, geology, rocks, things like that. This is a picture of Hurricane Ellen of 1973 seen from Skylab. This particular hurricane I think was only like one of two that got really strong really far north. I think it ended up making landfall in like Newfoundland, Canada. So this was a really interesting, powerful hurricane. It was like a category three um, that it got these beautiful pictures of. Um, there was also some high school students that did uh, experiments on Skylab. So a bunch of high school students submitted these proposals to have their experiments done on the Skylab spacecraft. And so I think like 19 of them were chosen. And one of them was to uh, figure out how spiders make their webs in space and see how like different that was. Um, and it turns out that they do look different from how they do here on Earth. <laughs> we've, we've blocked out the spider just in case anybody has arachnophobia because I do, but this one isn't too bad. It's very small and you can barely see that it's a spider. Um, but this spider is named Anita. So yeah, there were there were spiders that were brought up uh, into space. It reminds me of the animals. Um, and there were some other spiders as well. I think the other one was called Ara yeah, Arabella um, to see what their webs looked like among many other uh, experiments as well. All right, uh, yeah, well, here is all of them. These are, there's quite a few. It'd be busy bee on there. <laughs> all right, so uh, the last thing I just wanted to end with was that a lot of the technology that's used now, like when you think about the International Space Station, um, was developed during the Skylab space station days. Like this was all new, like how do you shower in space? How do you eat? How do you go to the bathroom? How do you sleep? Um, all of these things were, uh, were studied and uh, developed during this kind of Skylab era. So this is one of the astronauts from Skylab 2, um, Pete Conrad, uh, taking a shower in this like weird tube thing. Because if you take a shower on a space station, you know, it's just going to float away and then water can get into the equipment. It can be really dangerous. So you almost have to like seal yourself off in this little like cocoon, which is kind of cool. Toilets have to be specifically designed. You don't want that going all over the place. And actually, one of the main um, one of the main experiments that NASA prioritized as like this is the most important thing, or one of the most important things besides like repairing the space station, was to collect the waste from the astronauts uh, on board. So there were all of these protocols where if they had to make an emergency landing or, you know, go on or actually use the rescue mission, like they would have to bring all of the waste with them because it was that important. I don't really know many more details than that. Um, but that was a whole thing. 
there were all of these new kitchen facilities created, exercise equipment, sleeping bags, you'd have to sleep strapped in, um, otherwise you just float away and probably wouldn't be super comfortable, you might wake yourself up by just banging your head on a piece of equipment or something like that. So uh, a lot of technologies were developed during this period. All right, um, that's all I got. Are there any more questions? No more questions, just some participants who were happy to learn about Skylab. Awesome. Uh, well, it was very exciting to share all of this information with you all. I know that I learned a ton. I didn't know a whole lot about Skylab before, um, but it's super cool. And also next week, uh, feel free to tune in. Talia is going to be talking all about Mir. Is that next week, right, Talia? The Mir space station, I think. Okay, she's nodding yes. <laughs> All right, I'll hand it back over to you, Sarah. All right, thank you so much, Katie and Talia, for your awesome work and all of your incredible knowledge. Thank you all to the participants who joined us here today for our virtual planetarium. Feel free to join us again next week, same place, same time, where we will be uh, exploring more questions about what humans have done in space, what we've learned about our universe and what we still have yet to learn. So thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to support the museum and explore some of the work that we're doing right now with NASA. Have a wonderful rest of your week and thanks for joining us at the Virtual Planetarium.